see everybody here again. I, I know that um, Dale just got out of the hospital. I guess he's home now, and um, we pray for Dale all the time. I love being here, but it means that Dale can't be here, and so it's kind of a bittersweet thing, but I'm glad to be able to, to answer his request and to fill in for him, and we continue to pray that God would heal him completely. God is not finished with Dale. He has a lot to offer, and he has a lot more in his future. So let's just continue to persevere in prayer for our wonderful brother and your pastor, Dale King. It's been a while since I've been here, and I'm glad to be here again to uh, teach. I'll be here this week, and I'll be here next week as well. We're going to be this morning in James chapter 4, and I want to talk about something that is certain. And right now we live in a life in a world of great uncertainty and great turmoil and lots of, um, lots of voices, lots of noise, lots of uh, ideas just all out there, floating out there. And so what I want to do is look at what we know to be true as Christians. Now, James is the Lord's brother, well, his half-brother, if you will, but he was the Lord's brother, and he wrote this letter um, to just a, a group of Christians, as he put it, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion in chapter 1 uh, there at the beginning, meaning that this was directed to Christians who were of the Jewish faith, Jews who became Christians, and now James is writing to them. It's believed widely that James was the first letter written, the first of the New Testament letters or epistles that was written. And James was a very key figure in the church in Jerusalem at the very early uh, time of the church. In fact, there was a council at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 where there was a great discussion and argument about should the gospel be presented to Gentiles or non-Jews as well as to the Jews. And he was a key figure in that uh, and recognized that the gospel was for everybody, not just for a chosen few. And the thing is, this letter probably was written before that because this has a lot of sort of Old Testament feel to it, reminding everybody of things that are important. And he's very black and white in how he approaches Christianity and how he approaches how Christians ought to live. So it's quite an interesting letter and um, I'm sure you've all read it and you've probably studied it here, but I want to take a few verses out of chapter 4, beginning of verse 13, and, and take a look at some things that are absolutely certain and that we can grasp onto during this time. But I would like to pray first and ask for God to speak to every single one of us. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can be here today. In the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of all that's going on, we find comfort and we find peace and we find your presence here as we gather together. This, Lord, is a refuge. This is an oasis in the midst of all that's going on now. And we thank you for this time. And we thank you that we can be here together. And we want to look into your word for certainty. There's a lot out in the world that is uncertain, but we want to find that sense of certainty as far as who we are as Christians and what we can believe and, and what is true and then how we are to respond to that. And so may your Spirit speak to us today, and I pray that this Word would find good soil in our hearts and that it would go deep and produce fruit in our lives, such as the nature of your word, for which we give you thanks today in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's look at those verses. You know, before, even before we get to verse 13, as I was reviewing this chapter, I, I was reading the first few verses, and I thought, if this doesn't apply to the world today in which we live, particularly Christians, Man, I don't know what does. He says, what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And I was just, that just hit me as far as what I see happening among Christians today. There's a lot of 
a lot of disputing, a lot of fighting, a lot of quarreling. And I think at the root of it, either we don't get what we want or we're resentful for, against somebody who does. And these are reminders that we are called not only to love one another, but Jesus said to love our enemies as well. Love doesn't, doesn't boast and love doesn't stand its ground and, and, and make sure it's right. Love is compassionate. And love is gracious. And love allows room for somebody else to believe something a little bit differently or to take a different approach to something than you. Love gives that wide berth and allows us to continue to love one another. And I think that's something that we should always be reminded of. But anyway, we're going down to verse 13. And here's what he says. James says this. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. James minces no words here. And really, the idea is that we live life with relative certainties. We kind of play the odds when it comes to our approach to life and making plans for the future. How long are we going to live? What about our retirements? What about the times and the seasons of life? The rhythms of life. Generally, we can depend upon those things. But is it really that certain? 2020 has taught us, is teaching us, some very painful lessons about this. How many of us made certain plans this year and we've had to ditch them? How many of us had lots of things we had hoped to do and places we were going to go? We've had to put them aside because of an unexpected pandemic throughout the world. You know, I was, um, I was, you know, what I do is I go around the world and I teach and train pastors in other countries. Pardon me for a moment. And I got back from India and Nepal in March, I'm sorry, yeah, March the 14th. And a couple of days later, everything got shut down. And that's what I do, though. I go four, three or four or five times a year somewhere at the invitation of leaders in another country to go and teach. And so I got back, and in April, I had a trip planned. Everything was paid for to go to Tanzania and work with a group of pastors there in a few different cities. But I had to ditch that. And I thought, all right, maybe later in the year. As the year year has gone on, I've realized there's probably not going to be any later this year to do something like that. Now we're approaching December, and I realize I don't know if I'll be able to do this until next, maybe next summer at the earliest, and even still I'm getting invitations to go and do this. Well, I've had to adjust it. That's my ministry, but I've had to make adjustments. And when I read this, where he says, you know, come now. You who say, today and tomorrow we'll go into such and such a place. He's speaking to merchants there, by the way. He's talking about, we'll make a profit. He says, come on, you people who think you're going to go make money doing this and that. He says, take, take another look. But the, 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 the spirit of that is that we may have great plans, but we've had to make adjustments. I know for me, it's been tough because I love doing what I do, so I've had to do it from home. Maybe... Um, Uh, We're sending relief to a lot of people. A lot of my friends in other countries are literally starving and have no money, and their economies are shut down. And we see that in our country, too. You know, driving here, I saw some businesses that have been closed down. It made me so sad to think people have put their lives into things, and now they've had to shut down and sort of retool. None of it is easy, but I know some of my friends in other countries are having it particularly hard because they just don't have 
the funds. They don't have the money. They don't have the economy. And so they have to, they have to scrounge around for, just for food to be able to exist. But here he's saying, really, the idea is <clears throat> you think you're in control and you think that you're going to make plans and do something, but be careful because you just do not know. So what we think is certain maybe isn't so certain. And so we have the myth of being in control. The myth, James' statement is meant to say, come on, you who are missing the big picture. Those who make plans to the exclusion of any disruptive influences, including God. He's saying you're not in control as much as you think you might be. Life is much bigger than any one of us here. We think we can control what goes on in our lives. And we, this, <clears throat> if anything, 2020 has shown us we don't. We cannot control it. We are not in control. But our response is within our control. How I deal with it, that's in my control. And so, what we do not know, there's three things I want to mention that we do not know. And then we'll talk about the things that we do know. We can lose sight of the limitations that life places on us. We have a lack of information. We have our own mortality to deal with. We seem to ourselves sometimes to be immortal, as if we're going to live forever and last forever. Sometimes we have the idea that we're invincible. We know we're not, but we kind of think we are sometimes. Like we're going to last forever. <clears throat> someday you'll wake up and realize, you know, you've got a lot of gray hair. And someday you'll wake up and realize you've reached the age of retirement. Those, the years just seem to flow by so quickly. And then we wake up and they're gone. When I, I was a teacher at the Calvary Chapel Bible School this is like 40 years ago, you know, we had so many interactions with so many students all the time. I loved it. And so every now and then, I, I receive a message or a greeting or something from one of the former students. And, they'll, you know, I think, I think I probably look the same, probably not much different than I did 40 years ago. Then I realized, no, I really do. So do they. Life goes on, and I remember them as this way, and now I see them and realize, yeah, boy, the years have, have quickly gone by. We're not immortal. <clears throat> We're not invincible. We are at the mercy of God. And so, what are the things that we, re we think we know, but we don't? What we don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, is what tomorrow is going to bring. It's so simple. We don't even know if there's going to be a tomorrow, much less make our plans for it. Life can throw anything at us. You know, we have to tread lightly as we, as we walk into the future because we don't know what the future is going to bring. Jesus himself said in Matthew, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus was making us realize and to see that we don't know what tomorrow is going to be, so let's be careful about tomorrow. Let's take care of business today. <clears throat> you understand, that doesn't mean don't plan. We have to plan like we're going to be here. But, as we're going to see toward the end of the chapter, we have to sort of put those plans in a conditional viewpoint through the lens of maybe these things will happen, maybe not. But Jesus said, we don't even know what tomorrow is going to bring, so let's not be too anxious about tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. The, another thing we don't know, we don't know the length of our lives. <clears throat> now, Psalm 90 verse 10 says, the length of our days or the number of our years is three score and ten. That's 70. In case you're not sure what three score is, 70 years. It's not an absolute but generally speaking, the psalmist said, the days of our, our lives are 70 years. And then he says, and if you're strong enough, 80. 
Now, I just turned 70, and so <clears throat> I realized, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of living on borrowed time now. And I know that that's not absolute, that you're, you, know, you get 70, and if you're lucky, you get 80, but that's kind of a general rule. We know that a lot of people don't make it to 70. We know a lot of people make it past that. There's a, a, a wonderful, wonderful lady who comes to our, our home Bible study group. We're doing it on Zoom now. Every Tuesday night, we have a, a Zoom Bible study meeting, and there's about 15 or 16, 20 people sometimes that show up, not just from here, but a pastor in Nepal, he and his wife, uh, some friends in Southern California. But our, our Bible study group, one lady is 97 years old, and she's sharp sharp as a tack in her mind. She's, she's physically doing very well. And I think, now, God, that is a picture of the blessing you can put on somebody because we know a lot of people don't reach even close to that age, but God bless her. She continues to be a great blessing in our lives. In fact, sometimes uh, some of the people in the group start talking about their, you know, their aches and pains, and she doesn't want to hear any of it. She'll tell us, I don't want to hear about any of your aches and pains or sicknesses. And I think, okay, she has the right to say that. I mean, I don't want to hear it either, but I, I haven't earned the right to say it. But, so we don't, but, but generally speaking, we have 70 years, maybe 80 if we're lucky. We don't know. And so we can't make plans as if we're going to live forever because it's uncertain. And we're going to see what we can do about that. We hope we live a long time. We hope we live a long and blessed life. And may God grant us the ability to do that. And then thirdly, what we don't know is the plan of God. We lack the information. We have to look up and look to Him. We, we, we don't know what His ideas are. We don't know what His plans are. But I can tell you, there's a verse in Isaiah. I love this verse in Isaiah chapter 55 where Isaiah writes and says, for as the, or, or, yeah, he says in verse 8, actually, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Yeah. I, sometimes I think I know what God's will is. I, I, I act upon it. I, I, I hope that I'm doing the right thing. But in reality, what God has planned for my life, really, he doesn't share that information with me often until my life happens. You know, until that plan begins to be executed in my life, I don't, I don't really know what his plans are. I would like to tell him what my plans are and say, this is what I'd like to see happen. But unfortunately, God isn't like a genie, and we, we don't rub a, a lamp and just say, okay, God, please grant this in my life. We just don't know. We do not know what the plan of God is. And James says in our life is like a mist. He says, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. We're like a mist. We're here for a brief period of time. And then we're gone. In the scope of eternity, in the light of all eternity, we're just barely a blip, if that, on the timeline of eternity. And so when it comes to the plan of God, he sees from above. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are, not, my ways are far higher than yours. So I go about life thinking, this is God's plan, and then I realize it, it, it changes there are a lot of things that I didn't consider. And sometimes I look back and say the thing that I really wanted more than anything else, the thing that I wanted to be God's plan didn't turn out, and I'm glad. Because had that turned out, this would never have happened. We just, we just don't know what the plan of God is. You know, we live by faith, and we have faith in God. I, and, and what I have faith in not so much is that he's going to speak to me so clearly all the time because I'm not capable of hearing God all the time. But I have great faith in his goodness and in his, and who he describes himself to be in the Old Testament. He said that he's a God full of grace and full of mercy and full of goodness, and his face shines upon us. That's what I 
trust in. And if I grasp that, that his thoughts toward me are good, and that he's full of mercy and full of grace and full of kindness and full of compassion, then I can pretty much weather any storm knowing that that is true. You understand that? That is true. I can cling to that. Life doesn't mean, it, it doesn't mean life would be easy for me. It means that I can go through life trusting in his goodness and in his compassion. And so all of us have issues we have to deal with. Uh, probably all of us have had to adjust our lives dramatically over the last eight or nine, ten months. We've had to, maybe you've had to become homeschool parents when you didn't think you were ever going to. Maybe you've had to look for another job, or maybe you've lost your job. But we, we, if we cling to His goodness and we, and, and we understand and grasp who He is and what His nature is, we can endure anything. And so he gives us now the preface to all of our plans. And he, he says in verse um, 15, instead, instead of what? Instead of thinking that you can do whatever you want to do anytime, any place, and that you're going to make a certain amount of money and all of those things, he said instead of that, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. The all-important if. That brings everything into focus. This changes my outlook on everything. He talked about those who boast and brag that, about their plans, and really there's a lack of humility there. Humility isn't, isn't, I don't mean by humility to be shy in front of people and to be, have your head kind of looking down all the time. The humility, true humility, is recognizing that God's in heaven and I'm on earth and that, that I don't know all the information that I must submit my life to God and, and, and just saying, God, thy will be done. To me, that's what humility is. It's deference to God and to his will. And if I, you know, if you could take two parallel lives, one and, and give them the same event, and one is a Christian and one isn't. Or one trusts in God and one doesn't. One might be bitterly disappointed and go through life bitter and angry at life. And the other person may understand that God has other ideas. And to accept what God brings. And to accept the will of God. And not fight Him and not argue with Him. And not go through the rest of your life bitter and, and, and being disappointed at what you weren't able to get or what you weren't able to be. That's where that if comes in. That's why I call it the all-important if. Because then I could say, Lord, we hope to do this and hope to do that, and that's our prayer, if it's your will. Lord, if it be your will, let this happen. And that if, if I really believe that when I say that, then I can take whatever comes my way and recognize that God still watches over me. God still hovers over us. God still extends his compassion and his mercy to every one of us. We're never out of his sight. And nothing ever goes by without him seeing it. And, you know, there are a lot of questions. Why did God allow this to happen? Why did God... I don't... You know, we, we can't answer those questions. And, and, you know, does God allow things to happen? Well, I look at it this way. Everything that happens must be that God allows it. We'll never know what he didn't allow. But we look at life and we say, <clears throat> we're here and we live life and we face trials and we have to go through changes and God understands that. So the if changes my outlook on everything. God, let your will be done. If, if it be your will, let this happen. And um, I don't always, I'm not always happy about it, but I understand that God's will is going to be done. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus told us to say, you know, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that, that, <clears throat> that is the way, what, one of the key components of prayer, saying, God, thy will be done, not mine. So many years ago, I heard this, uh, this sort of a parable um, it's kind of a takeoff of the, of the Beatitudes where 
Uh, someone told me, blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. You know, and I've heard that for many years. And it's a funny thing, but I really do believe that. If we, we, are, if we recognize that that all-important, if helps us to be flexible and to be willing to make the changes, then we won't break under the weight of things that we don't understand. I don't understand this pandemic. It's funny because Debbie and I, you know, it, one, thing, one good thing that's come out of it is given, it's given my wife and I much more time to pray together. And um, so we've seen some great breakthroughs in the things that we've, the certain things we, we pray and we labor over it. And, and it's just deep in our hearts and we've seen God answer some great prayers. But sometimes we'll pray and we'll say, God, lift this pandemic. <clears throat> and I think, okay, there are what, 8 billion people in the world or 9 billion or something like that. And there's two of us here praying that the pandemic would be lifted. I assume others are praying the same thing. And I think, what, what good is my prayer going to do? But we'll pray it anyway. But see, I don't understand why this is happening. I'm not going to try to sort of uh, put it in a context or make sense of it. <clears throat> Sometimes we can't make sense of things that don't seem to make any sense. You know, God, I, I would never presume to say, well, this is God's judgment or this is why God is doing this. I, I don't, because God hasn't given me that information. And if someone says that, well, maybe you have God's ear more than I do. Or maybe you're just, you know, making things up. We don't know why this is happening. I do know this, that where I am and where I live and what my life is, it compels me to trust God and to pray and to pray for my loved ones and pray for family and friends and to make the adjustments necessary in my life because I do believe this too shall pass. I don't know when. Nobody does. Nobody knows when it's going. I mean, the experts, everybody, they, there's so many ideas, but it doesn't look like anytime soon. But, it, but I, so I just trust God and say, God, it's in your hands. Maybe there's a reason you have for this. Maybe this is just something that happened, and, and, and I don't know. But may I be flexible and, and adapt to whatever you put in my life. You know, a few months ago, uh, and we, I didn't post this on social media because I didn't want to be, um, I don't know what, what you call it, uh, travel shamed. But we had planned since last year, we had planned all our family, uh, wife and I and our children and our grandchildren, to take a, a week and spend it at the beach in Southern California. It was last summer we took two of our, grand, our oldest granddaughters and we took them and they got surfing lessons and we had a great time in Southern California. They said, let's do this as a family next year. So all year we've been planning it. We rented a big place, a six-bedroom house in, in Oceanside and right on the beach. And then not only the pandemic hit, but like a few weeks before we were going to go, Debbie was stepping off, Debbie is my wife, the bottom step in our house and broke her ankle. And we thought, oh, okay, well... Uh, does, is this going to stop anything? And then, then three days before we flew down, she had surgery on it. And she was in a big, big brace, a big boot. And, and she is just like, she's a trooper. She said, okay, let's do this. So someone loaned us a knee, you know, knee scooter. And she was scooting around the house and maneuvered through the airport. We have a, a wheelchair business, so I was able to get a wheelchair pretty easily. And uh, we made it work. And, um, you know, again... That's a first world problem. But the idea I'm getting at is that we, we have to learn to flex and to be, be flexible, to be bendable, to recognize that life throws curves at us that we don't expect. And maybe our plans, we could have just ditched them, we, but, but we trust that God watches over us and that wasn't an unexpected thing in her life or in, in, in my life. A year ago, uh, my, my daughter one day, she's 41, she came to our house and she said, we have to talk to you. And I thought, oh, that's never a good thing. You know, when your, your, your daughter calls and says, uh, you know, her, she and her husband, they're going to come, we need to talk to you guys. I thought, uh-oh. Okay, they have two teenage daughters, uh, God knows what's going on. She burst in the house and said, I'm pregnant. You know, and she, she, it was an unexpected pregnancy. 
And that threw all everybody's plans into turmoil, and the two teenage daughters didn't really like it very much. And I mean, I'm putting it, putting it lightly and kindly. Now we have this beautiful little grandson who's four months old, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't have it any other way. It's such a delight and such a joy to have him. And, you know, the beginning of that seemed like, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to make this adjustment? And now it's all pl- playing out beautifully and wonderfully. You just don't know what life is going to bring. And who would have thought that in 2020 there would be this pandemic that would pretty much just grip the world and stop the world's economy and fill hospitals all over the world? I love to go to India, and I was thinking maybe early next year. I could, and I just read yesterday in New Delhi, it's just sort of exponentially um, multiplying the cases and the hospitals are getting more full and I just think you know God I you know my plans are nothing I just want those people to not have to suffer and not have to deal with this so we just don't know and we have to remain flexible and then what I think we should do and what we can do is look for opportunities to serve and to help others In this pandemic, I could sit and be whining about my own life and be disappointed about so many things, or I can say, all right, within the context of my life, how can I help? How can I serve? How can I make life better for somebody else? See, that's the key. I know what is unknown, If I can say that, I know what I can't know, I know what I don't know, and I don't know what the future holds, but I do know that I can make a difference in somebody's life. I do know that I can help somebody in some way, a small way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be monumental, it doesn't have to be global, it doesn't have to be anything that anybody else knows about. But I think I can take this opportunity during this time to look for ways to serve and to help other people. God knows there's enough people that need our help. And so I'm healthy. I have some resources I can use. If I can't travel somewhere, then I can use those resources to help some other group in another country that is having a rough time. Early in the year, you know, inst- because I couldn't go to Tanzania, what we did with our ministry was, is um, they, uh, <clears throat> they, they were, the, the pastor I work with there, he's the head of a group of pastors in this one area of Tanzania. They were, they were getting five-gallon buckets with spigots on them and bars of soap so that people could wash their hands and not spread the pandemic. So we were able to send money for them to buy, I don't know how many, a thousand of them or something like that. And they distributed them in the churches and in the villages. Same thing in, in Nepal, we, we were able to help with that, and uh, several other countries. So my thought is, if I can't go, then we can at least make a difference in the life of somebody else. But it doesn't have to be there, it can be here. It can be my neighbor. It can be a person in my Bible study group, a person in my church, one of my relatives. What I'm saying is, we have opportunities, and, and, and so we can help and serve other people. Now, you may have lost your job. You may have a rough time financially right now. And, uh, and, and, and so may God grant you your, your, the answers to your prayers. But even in the midst of that, we can find ways to help and serve others. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you can? I, I, I hope you believe that. And then finally, he says this. Whatever... I'm sorry, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Yikes. What does he mean by that? Knowing the right thing to do. Knowing what is good. And that means to, in in one sense, humbly trust God and also allow God to perform His work in your life. See, to me, Doing good, doing the right thing is trusting God with my life, with my plans, and saying, God, thy will be done. But another right thing to do is to help others and serve others. And if I know to do that and I withhold 
myself or, or, or I don't want to let go of something, then I'm, that's not a good idea. As James says in his black and white way, he says, whoever knows to do it and doesn't, it is sin. I don't like that word, but it's a word that is very prominent in the Bible and, and so much so that Christ died for our sins. But also, what is the right thing to do? What has God put on your heart to do? Maybe for you, it's finally time to give your life to Christ. Maybe you've been sitting here and been listening for a long time, but you never made that commitment and surrendered your life. That's the right thing to do for you. And if you know that to be true, then do it. <laughs> it may, uh, saying that reminded me of, uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up here in just a minute. Many, many years ago, when I was just a young man, I think I was 21 or 22, I, w- I-, I met this couple. They were kind of a hippie couple. And they were traveling around. They had their guitars. And, and I said to them, have you given your lives to Christ? And they said, no. And I said, then you know what you need to do. And that was it. That was my great evangelistic sermon. So they went... They, they, they went back, and they did it. They went, I think, to the, to the back of the place we were staying, and they gave their lives to Christ. And since that day, that was like, I think 1972 maybe, since that time they've been not only serving the Lord, but worship leaders and, and, and songwriters and involved in ministry. And it was, it was kind of like they knew what to do, and they finally they were kind of given a little prod, and they did it. That's called low-hanging fruit. And I wish every, every evangelistic effort was that easy. But for them, it was the right thing to do, and they did it. Maybe for you, it's time to give your life to Christ. If that's true, then do it. Don't hold back. God has so much for us, and God wants to watch over our lives and hover over us, and He has the plan of salvation for every single one of us. Anyway, to, to sum it up, When we think of the future, we know what is certain, and that is that God is compassionate and God is gracious and He never changes. We know that we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know how long we're going to live. We don't know what the plan of God is, but in the midst of that, we can trust Him and then look for ways to serve other people. We will all get through this. I look forward to the time I can come back here and nobody has a mask on, and we're all able to embrace each other and worship, that'll happen. Until then, and even beyond then, let's trust Him, love others, serve others, and see how we can show the love of Jesus Christ in in our daily lives. Would you please stand with me, and we'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word, which is a lamp and a light to every one of us. Without your Word, I don't know what we would do. We would have to be groping around in life for some sort of meaning. But your Word tells us what what is certain is that you love us and you are compassionate and you're gracious. And sometimes we feel you, sometimes we don't, but that is a certainty. We want to grasp onto that in a world of great uncertainty right now. We don't know the future. We don't know when this is going to end. We don't know how things are going to play out, but we do know that we can trust you. Not only should we trust you, but give us those opportunities to serve and to bless other people in whatever way that we can. Let us honor you by doing that. Let us express our faith by doing that and show the reality of what we believe. As James also says, that faith without any demonstration of it is dead. Let us demonstrate our faith and our love for you by loving others and serving others. For that is the nature of Christ. Keep us all safe, Lord. Keep us all healthy. And we pray for Dale that you would continue to bring healing to him. Let him know how much he's loved and how much we care for him and pray for him. And we commit this coming week to you 
We thank you for your word in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Thank you.